Good morning, pre-university long fiction students, and welcome to yet another module in our uh, distance learning video lecture series, where we will continue our study of William Faulkner's modernist masterpiece, As I Lay Dying. Um, today I'm going to begin the lecture uh, just discussing a wee bit uh, how things will go over the next few weeks. Uh, as I mentioned in my email that I sent out on Friday, I was slightly dejected uh, <clears throat> in looking at the viewing habits and access patterns uh, of students with the material that has been posted thus far uh, since we went into a distance learning model for the semester. Um, some of you are clearly working quite hard. Uh, and some of you are sloughing off, frankly, and using the coronavirus crisis as an excuse to not do your schoolwork. Um, I mean, I understand that it's a difficult moment for everyone. Uh, enforced isolation and whatnot is not the most fun scenario, certainly. Um, but we have to make do with what we have to make do with. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping that you're mature enough to <clears throat> deal with the realities and to be also self-motivated enough to do the work that's required. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I will periodically give you assignments within the class period uh, that you will be asked to submit with a very strict time deadline. So if you are not uh, checking your MEOs and not checking the material and the lectures and et cetera, um, you will not get the opportunity to do those assignments and you will receive grades of zero for them. So that's basically a you know, hard push to make sure that you do the work uh, if you care about your grade. If you don't care about your grade, I guess you can stay in bed and that's quite okay too. Um, anyways, <clears throat> um, so we're going to continue working on uh, Faulkner's novel for the next few class periods. There actually will be uh, a moment where I will post uh, extended discussion questions that you can work on on your own <clears throat> and then uh, keep in mind that the video conference calls, the Zoom conferences on Wednesday mornings uh, will continue. And so whenever there are assignments posted, typically um, you will have the opportunity to communicate with me if you so desire. Uh, when I open the online class forum, um, you can certainly be present for them. Um, not very many of you have been present for them so far. So that, you know, whatever the benefit flows, I think, to those who are present. That's a decision you're certainly, hopefully, mature enough to make on your own. Um, <clears throat> so today, uh, we're going to look at As I Lay Dying, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, some of its modernist subtexts. I talked about this while we were still in the classroom uh, back in March, uh, before the reading week break even, <clears throat> and uh, just a couple of things to remember. Uh, modernism is a literary movement that started in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, mostly after World War I. There was this sense of uh, desperation. It's kind of, it's actually interesting uh, because one of the uh, catalysts for some of the modernism uh, in art and some of the innovations that came about uh, were mostly World War I and also uh, the Spanish influenza pandemic, which killed millions of people in 1918. Uh, and there was a real sense, and something that's probably being paralleled uh, in what we're experiencing right now, depending uh, where you are on the world, but certainly in certain places uh, right now, where the feeling was that the nation state and uh, the institutions that were given the responsibility of holding society and civilization together failed miserably. Um, and World War I was a cataclysmically uh, horrific war and the Spanish influenza pandemic uh, killed, as I said, millions of people. And people felt like the church and the state, <clears throat> the modern nation state uh, were not up to the task. They didn't do what they, people had hoped that they would do. And so uh, there was an artistic reaction uh, somewhat, there's, you know, there's a hint of nihilism in it, certainly, uh, but it's an artistic reaction that's breaking uh, with the past and trying to redefine um, so, sort of the terms of artistic creation, 
Uh, there was a quote that I have in the quotes uh, that are posted on Leia, quotes for studying Faulkner, uh, that was by John Barth. We talked about it briefly. I'm just going to read through it quickly and reiterate the main points because I think it's a good uh, starting off position for us to consider modernist uh, literature. Uh, it says, in their attempt to throw off the aesthetic burden of the realist novel, these writers, the early modernists, introduced a variety of literary tactics and devices, the radical disruption of linear flow of narrative, the frustration of conventional expectations concerning unity and coherence of plot and character, and the cause and effect development thereof, the deployment of ironic and ambiguous juxtapositions to call into question the moral and philosophical meaning of literary action, the adoption of a tone of epistemological self-mockery aimed at naive pretensions of bourgeois rationality, the opposition of inward consciousness to rational public objective discourse, and an inclination to subjective distortion to point up the evanescence of the social world of the 19th century bourgeoisie. That's taken from John Barth, The Literature of Replenishment. Um, now that we've finished the novel, again, I know that's a pithy lit crit type quote. You probably don't like reading things like that. That wouldn't put you in any kind of minority in the world, I don't think. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but, but now that we have finished uh, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, you should be able to see some of the things that Barth is mentioning uh, very, very directly. And the novel really does break with all of these um, conventions. Obviously, if we contrast it with Pride and Prejudice, again, something that we did at the beginning, but maybe now we're in a much better position to do that uh, thoroughly um, with a little bit more of a little more depth to it. But uh, that whole chronological linear narrative that Austin projects with an omniscient uh, narrative perspective on it is uh, very much, you know, thrown out the window. That's not part of Faulkner's playbook by any stretch of the imagination. And so uh, the modernist uh, workings here are going somewhere else. As we mentioned, you know, the world uh, leading up to modernism had been very dramatically destabilized. Um, you have the innovations, scientific, philosophical, psychological, um, innovations, you know, related to Darwin's origin of species. Um, in the 1860s, you have <clears throat> Einstein's uh, various theories of relativity in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Sigmund Freud and his theories of psychological uh, importance occurring in Vienna in the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. All those things and many other ones um, kind of re redefined the way that people understand the world. <clears throat> and that redefinition uh, certainly had a, had a pretty pronounced effect on many artists and what they saw as their role, what they should be doing. So uh, Faulkner is one of them. Um, you know, this, this book, perhaps more than most of his other ones, but in a little sequence of, uh, you know, high, high modernist uh, fiction that he wrote, uh, really exemplifies uh, a lot of those changes. And of course, we can talk about it in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a couple points I want to make about it today, uh, but basically, um, he's you know he's challenging all of the conventions of the realist novel. We've talked previously um, about the idea of stream of consciousness, as I get said. Um, Barth, uh, you know, talks a little bit about the opposition of inward consciousness to rational public objective discourse. Clearly, um, this book makes, uh, prioritizes and privileges, uh, you know, inward consciousness, the idea that each of these people, each of these narrators uh, in the story have something to add, something of worth, right? We don't have this godlike uh, objective voice. We have a very, very pointedly subjective, subjective series of voices, and those voices actually belong to you know, a bunch of strange rednecks, basically, a um, bunch of country people who have, a, you know, a whole, whole sort, you know, an assortment of limitations, um, both possibly intellectual, uh, linguistic, uh, you know, with respect to their levels of education and with respect to other uh, cultural defining things about them. So we, you know, we, Faulkner has taken, again, we look, when we talked about the novel in the beginning of the semester, the novel, um, you know, is sort of an everyman's form, right? So we've moved away from epic, 
and uh, tragedy and those classical literary forms that are typically uh, the purview of kings and warriors and great great men um, and we've gone to the you know the idea that any any man um, a small unimportant person can be uh, a valid subject for literary consideration and so Faulkner uh, like a lot of those other high modernists uh, was rather preoccupied with uh, making it new right they took their uh, mantra from the, the American poet Ezra Pound who in his cantos number 53 <clears throat> that is also included on that list of quotes I had for studying Faulkner uh, he has Ching prayed to the mountain and wrote make it new on his bathtub day by day make it new cut underbrush pile the logs keep it growing um, and that became sort of a you know the way that these poets worked uh, the, the modernist poets most notably T.S. Eliot uh, and Pound and the novelists uh, most famous among them probably James Joyce Faulkner himself and uh, probably Virginia Woolf and so they uh, they had a very you know consciously uh, iconoclastic attitude T.S. Eliot famously in one of his essays wrote uh, poets in our civilization as it exists at present must be difficult um, and there was a sense of sort of erudition and uh, you know kind of exclusivity that they were not writing for the everyman uh, breaking with the attitudes of the romantic poets in the 19th century who thought that poetry and literature should be approachable simple mimicking uh, you know human normal human speech uh, the modernists felt that there was something uh, very very different at work <clears throat> and so it was about innovation and it was about the possibility of art uh, possibly picking up and doing things that uh, other aspects of the society seemed to be less adept at doing and so they it was you know considering art as uh, sort of an essential activity one where there was a metaphysical component to it that was important and it's one of the strong arguments that can be made about the value of art and about literature uh, is that it is that that um, you know sometimes the most important things occur there uh, Nietzsche famously said that that art is where we go for our metaphysics <clears throat> and so um, it had to be you know innovative the the bourgeois staid realist novel of the 19th century was seen as not doing its job <clears throat> not doing the job, let's say the big high job that was supposedly uh, for art to do. So we have a, we have a beautiful example um, in in the novel. This is on page one hundred and thirty two, and it happens when, uh, if you remember, when Jewel was leaving at night to go and work. Uh, he was working lawn quicks back forty acres in order to earn money to get his horse. And Darl and Cash were speculating about what he was doing when he was away every night. And uh, these words are spoken by Darl. Uh, when something is new and hard and bright, there ought to be something a little better for it than just being safe. Since the safe things are just the things that folks have been doing so long, they have worn the edges off. And there's nothing to the doing of them that leaves a man to say what it was not done, that it was not done before and it cannot be done again. Um, it's kind of a philosophical statement, sort of suggesting perhaps, uh, you know, a number of things. I mean, it's spoken by Darl. He's probably, you know, the most articulate and the most possibly problematic voice also um, of the 15 narrators in the book. Uh, and it kind of, Darl has a strong association with Faulkner. There's an element, um, an authorial voice. Some of his preoccupations mimic some of uh, Faulkner's. And so, you know, we can kind of imagine uh, Faulkner at this time should have been relatively self-assured. Um, he had just written, you know, up to that time, his greatest novel and probably actually still to this time, his greatest novel, The Sound and the Fury uh, in 1929. Uh, but it had been, uh, you know, somewhat, uh, you know, a, not, not the warmest of receptions. <clears throat> As I said previously, he had just married uh, a divorced woman with two children uh, a few months before and so and uh, he had written a book entitled Sanctuary that was 
kind of a mercenary act. It was supposed to be a bit of a pot boiler that was going to earn him a bunch of money, and actually the publishers had uh, not accepted it. So he, uh, you know, all, all of these kind of forces conspired to make him perhaps somewhat uneasy as he began writing The Sound of the Fury. Um, he made a comment about it saying that, quote, um, it will be a book by which in a pinch I can stand or fall if I never touch ink again. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, all these things coming together, he felt like he had written uh, a great, great work. And, uh, you know, he had made the very conscious decision um, in, in both of these books, uh, Sound of the Fury and, and As I Lay Dying, he made a conscious decision to focus on uh, the Yaknapatafa County, his famous fictional region. Um, as I mentioned in that list of quotes before we had looked at this, um, <clears throat> where he says, this is in an interview he gave, uh, I believe at the University of Virginia, and he says, uh, beginning with Sartorius, I discovered that my own little postage stamp of native soil was worth writing about and that I would never live long enough to exhaust it. And by sublimating the actual to the apocryphal, I would have complete liberty to use whatever talent I might have to its absolute top. And Yaknapatafa, according to him, is a Chickasaw word that means water runs slow through flat land. And so he, um, he decided that these poor rural uh, white uh, farmers would be suitable, you know, food for him to examine, fodder for his uh, artistic imagination. And so uh, he, he did that. Um, he wrote about his place. Now, this is a, this is a kind of a, a risky decision. Um, most of the high modernists were very closely associated with urban metropolitan uh, society, uh, very erudite, very, you know, kind of somewhat intellectual aristocracy. Um, and so, you know, Eliot is writing in London, Joyce is writing in Dublin, Hemingway in Paris. Um, and so you have this, uh, this sense of what they're doing, uh, for Faulkner, uh, the idea that he's going to focus on, uh, you know, the redneck South, uh, this rural, somewhat backwards place and that he's going to, uh, you know, elevate it and use it as his, uh, you know, the springboard for his great art is, is somewhat risky decision. Um, so, uh, much of what he does in this book is, you know, very frankly imaginative. Uh, there's a fair bit of technical dazzle. Um, it's innovation at a, at a very high point. You have multiple, uh, multiple viewpoints, stream of consciousness, narration, disruption of logical and temporal sequence, juxtaposition, repetition, uh, elaborate speculations on the nature of language, sophisticated rhetorical complexities. Okay, all of those things are what make the novel kind of dizzying. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Typically, with Sejep students, the experience of reading it is usually, at least initially, somewhat frustrating. Um, my hope is always by forcing you to read a book like this that we can then spend a little time looking at it together, and hopefully, we can unearth a little bit about what it is that makes it great. Uh, and I think that's a possibility. Um, and so, Faulkner, um, much like some of the other modernists, he is reimagining uh, form. And so what is the novel? You know, at the beginning of the semester, we talked about the novel as a break. It's a new form uh, in and of itself, even, you know, it's a couple hundred years old. By the time Faulkner is writing this novel, it's already still a couple hundred years old. Um, but basically, it is very different from those previous ancient forms, classical forms, as I said, most notably, uh, epic tragedy, and also chivalric romance, which typically have a higher aristocratic uh, part to them. Now, Faulkner, uh, much like some of the other modernists, looks back to those literary forms and tries to reincorporate them. Um, probably the most famous of all modernist works is James Joyce's Ulysses. Ulysses is the story of uh, Leopold Bloom, a Dublin, a Jewish uh, ad man who lives in Dublin, Ireland. 
and it's basically the story of a day in his life. He goes out, he spends the day out, and he's coming home to his wife, Molly Bloom, uh, and the story takes 24 hours, um, but it parallels the story of the Odyssey. <clears throat> the Odyssey is the story of Odysseus's return from the Trojan War uh, in ancient Greece by Homer. That story takes 10 years. Odysseus finishes the war, and he gradually makes his way back to Ithaca to his wife, Penelope. And so Joyce parallels uh, the Odyssey. Ulysses is the Latin name for Odysseus, the hero of the book. And so there's kind of a colonial context, the Latin to the Greek, uh, the Irish to the English, Leopold Bloom, the Jew. There's all these elements that are layered there. And so he retells this epic tale uh, in a very modern, uh, shocking way. Uh, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, there's frank sexuality in it. Uh, there's uh, blasphemous, <clears throat> you know, anti-Christian attitudes, which in Ireland in the 1920s was problematic and other things like that. And so Faulkner similarly takes uh, a page out of that playbook. Um, we mentioned at our beginning, the beginning of our study of this novel that the title comes from a quote from the Odyssey, same book, um, book 11, uh, the Gathering of Shades, where Agamemnon descends, excuse me, where Odysseus descends to the underworld and encounters his mother and his um, and other people, but he also encounters the illustrious heroes of the Trojan War, the ones who died in the war, uh, and Agamemnon, who died upon returning from the war when he was killed by Aegisthus, his wife Clytemnestra's lover. And so just there we have a very strong theme Again, we talked about that at the beginning of the book. Now we can see it a little more pointedly because the story of Hattie Bundren and her illicit affair with Reverend Whitfield is parallel uh, in the story of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. And so we have the, uh, the title referencing that particular quote, which puts us in the mind of the epic form, uh, epic literature being that great uh, heroic narrative, right, with lots of conventions. We've talked previously about Katabasis, the descent to the underworld, uh, the invocation of the muses, and you have all these uh, grandiose epic similes. You typically have the elevation of an ascendant community, and uh, very often you have supernatural elements and very strong uh, delineation and gradation of delineation between human and the new human and the non-human, something that we also see pointedly in Faulkner's book. Um, the Odyssey is a nostos narrative, a narrative of return. Here we have again the story of the Bundrens trying to bring Addie back to her home, to her burial in Jefferson, and so it has uh, permutations and hints of that uh, that nostos narrative as well, uh, and. There's also uh, kind of a toying with that sense of heroism because certainly there is behavior within the book that seems to be heroic, uh, but by and large, uh, most of what happens does not seem to be something that we would call heroic. And in fact, uh, the, the nature of heroism is debased to some extent because we start to realize that pretty much every character has uh, an ulterior motive for going to Jefferson. Ants claims very pointedly that he made Addie a promise that he will bring her back to Jefferson because he told her she would, that was her dying wish, and he intends to honor it. Uh, but we know also that he wants to get a set of teeth. Uh, Dewey Dell, we know, wants to get an abortion. Right. Vardaman is obsessed with this toy train. Cash wants the gramophone, the graphophone. <clears throat> so all of these characters uh, have reasons to go to Jefferson. And in fact, it feels at times as if uh, the, the death of Addie and the obligation to bring her there uh, is just a convenient excuse to go. And the, the narrative becomes somewhat farcical, what they're trying to do to get her there. Obviously, there are all these obstacles uh, they could have just as easily buried her sooner, and everyone works on the assumption that they actually had done that, the people who see them making their way to Jefferson. So it seems to be, uh, we don't, I don't want to say ridiculous, but certainly um, not heroic, 
Now, sometimes we can see it as anti-heroic. And again, as we talked in the beginning of the semester, um, sometimes the novel is seen as uh, you know, an egalitarian and somewhat anti-heroic form. The idea that the, the protagonists of the novel tend to be uh, less important people <clears throat> and they may be, uh, you know, it sort of shows up the nature of people's desires and, and uh, you know, aspirations, making them not necessarily the greatest things, whereas the, you know, the epic sort of tries to accentuate uh, nobility of spirit, similarly, similarly to tragedy. Uh, where we have this ethical, moral sense about what the literature is supposed to do, the novel seems to be frivolous and light and perhaps suggests that humans are not such elevated creatures. We saw that a lot in Pride and Prejudice earlier in the semester, right, when we were um, talking about, you know, some of the characters and the way they're portrayed, even the perception of the novel, right, Mr. Collins, and in that book is very disparaging about the novel. You want to read novels from a free lending library? What more, uh, you know, what worse sign of your cultural depravity could there be than that? <clears throat> and so um, the novel does have a reputation. Now, as I said, when we get to the time of the, um, the narrative here, uh, these are not really concerned with that. Uh, the, the modernist novelists are much more, uh, they're writing to a very, very small public. They don't feel like they need to uh, condescend to people's desires, and they certainly, they, they don't do it. Another link uh, that the book makes <clears throat> to, the, to the epic form has to do with uh, the origins of epic, and epic was typically the first poetic form. The origins of epic begin with the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is pretty much the oldest uh, literary text that we know of. Similarly, the Odyssey, the Iliad by Homer, um, all of these have in common uh, that they spring from the oral narrative tradition. So epic poetry tends to be uh, the beginnings, at least the codification of uh, early oral storytelling. And that uh, had a strong place. Obviously, uh, for entertainment value when you didn't have all the diversions, the cultural diversions that we have nowadays, uh, storytelling took a central place. Because of the nature of the way this story has, is told, uh, that, that aspect of the book is very prominent as well. And having these multiple narrators and their uh, sort of homespun approach, again, you get a different voice telling a different story with different obsessions and different uh, predilections, and so the story goes every which way. <clears throat> um, when Vardaman is talking, uh, the digressions are, you know, particular, specific to each individual character. Um, and this brings me to some of the, uh, some of the uh, theoretical perspectives that we'd like to look at with regard to this novel. Um, one of the first <clears throat> is a very important uh, Russian critic by the name of Mikhail Bakhtin. And Bakhtin wrote uh, a rather important critical text in 1934 entitled Discourse in the Novel. And he talks a little bit about, uh, he, he has uh, a theory and he uses the novel uh, as the way to sort of uh, base where he bases his theory. Uh, and the idea <clears throat> is something known as heteroglossia and heteroglossia comes from the Greek hetero, uh, different, and glossa is tongue. So heteroglossia is the existence, the coexistence of varieties within a single linguistic code. And he's talking about the novel as this uh, multiform uh, uh, genre. And I'll quote from him. Uh, social dialects, characteristic group behavior, professional jargons, generic languages, languages of generations and age groups, tangen tendentious languages, languages of the authorities of various circles and of passing fashion serving to express authorial intent, but in a refracted way. Um, and that kind of suggests something about what the novel is, what we might call polyphony. Uh, polyphony means multiple voices, and obviously with Faulkner's novel, uh, at a very literal level, that makes sense. 
uh, but at a figurative level as well, in the sense that there's lots and lots of different types of language. <clears throat> and uh, the way uh, that the characters express themselves, you probably noticed at certain points in the novel, there are certain characters and there are certain passages by certain characters that read um, somewhat coherently. In other words, they have the, the certain elements of traditional narrative, whether it be uh, chronology and uh, direct uh, transmissibility so that the, what's being expressed is easy to decipher. Uh, however, you have uh, another layer of language here. And again, some of that relates to stream of consciousness and some of it relates to just the, the, the levels of expression within the book. Uh, so, so that characters like Darl, Dewey Dell, um, Vardaman even, can be uh, expressing ideas at multiple levels simultaneously. You may have noticed that um, because the, the novel is frankly extremely confusing uh, when you're trying to read it because it, it attempts to defy your ability to, uh, to decode it. Uh, you know, novel is, the novel is a code in a sense and you have to decipher it. Uh, you may have noticed in certain passages when Darl is reading that there are italics uh, within the text. Sometimes uh, the italics can mean, with Darl, sometimes he's toggling back and forth in time, and so he's addressing two different time periods simultaneously, uh, two different places simultaneously, and so the italics can signify that shift. Other times it's different layers of, uh, of sensibility and of, of expression. So. Some of these can be a surface level and could be reported speech, and there might be a subconscious level and then even an unconscious subconscious level uh, that, so that there, you're sort of burrowing deeper and deeper into uh, the psyche of the character. And of course, you know, that's very, very difficult to translate on the page. You can, you can be forgiven for being extremely confused in those instances. And so you have these, uh, you know, these social dialects within there that kind of define these groups. That's part of what Bakhtin is talking about, and these codes that unite uh, people. Different types of languages have a, you know, coded reality to them. Uh, there's another theorist that is relevant for our consideration of this particular novel. Uh, his name is Frank Kermode, uh, and he wrote a book, an important book entitled *The Genesis of Secrecy*. <clears throat> and his premise is. Uh, that we, uh, you know, we interpret the narrative. When we read the book, we're trying to interpret it, we're trying to make sense of it. And, but that the narrative in itself is an attempt to interpret reality. And so what we get um, when we read a novel is actually a meta-interpretation that we are interpreting Faulkner's interpretation of reality. Um, and so there's this kind of echo chamber um, <clears throat> and that uh, basically that secrets are generated through this process. As I said, the title of his book is The Genesis of Secrecy. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have the basic linguistic paradigm, the way that language is used to express. And then, uh, and then you have the socially codified uh, dialect, right, where uh, it certainly uh, it associates with particular people. Um, the very use of language can function as a socioeconomic and psychological portrait of the subset of the population. Here we see uh, the usage of language among these poor white farmers within the book that is, uh, you know, it defines the, the way they use language, defines the type of people that they are. Uh, and we see how they are. Uh, there's, an there's an element of prag pragmatism stoicism, uh, you know, this kind of strong moral responsibility. We can see that um, a number of places within the, within the novel, right? Um, if we think of starting at the very beginning when Cora Tull is speaking, and Cora is a very particular character, and she says, I saved out the eggs and baked yesterday. The cakes turned out right well. We depend a lot on our chickens. They're good layers. What few we have left after the possums and such. Snakes, too, in the summer. Snake will break up a hen house quicker than anything. So after you, <clears throat> after they were going to cost so much more than Mr. Tull thought, and after I promised that the difference in the number of eggs would make it up, I had to be more careful than ever because it was in my, on my final say-so we took them. 
could have stocked cheaper chickens, but I gave my promise, as Mrs. Longington said when she advised me to get a good breed, because Mr. Tull himself admits that a good breed of cows or hogs pays in the long run. So when we lost so many of them, we couldn't afford to use the eggs ourselves because I could not have had Mr. Tull chide me when it was on my say-so we took them. So when Mrs. Longington told me about the cakes, I thought I could bake them and earn enough at one time to increase the net value of the flock and the equivalent of two head, and that by saving the eggs out one at a time, even the eggs wouldn't be costing anything. And that week they laid so well that I had not only saved out enough eggs above that, we had enough we had engaged to sell to bake the cakes with. I had saved enough so that the flour and the sugar and the stove wood would cost nothing. Um, <clears throat> and so you kind of get this sense of Cora. This is the scene where obviously she's uh, getting ready. She's discussing baking these cakes that eventually the, the order for the cakes gets canceled and she's stuck with them. But she has this kind of moral rectitude when she's talking because she's the one who made the decision to get these chickens, the more expensive chickens. And she's very uh, attentive to the fact that, you know, some of them have been killed by possums and snakes. And this is, this is her responsibility. She's made the decision. And now that they've lost some of the chickens, she has to be super careful. And this kind of defines a, a lot of this, you know, sort of independence and a sense of moral responsibility that the characters have. They don't go uh, often blaming others. Now, there are other characters who do that, right? So there's this kind of complex little world view developing in the book. But uh, certainly Cora represents that uh, stoic sense. She's made these decisions. She has to abide by them. It's a bummer that the snakes and the possums come and kill your chickens, but that's the breaks. And you don't want Mr. Tull to, you know, be have that as a possible means to, to criticize your decision. And so you suck it up. And so this shows us how the soci socially coded uh, dialect kind of not only through the speech patterns, but through uh, the, the mentality also uh, defines the group of people. Um, now, coming back to uh, Kermode's idea of secrets, we see a number of them within the book. Actually, as, we, as it starts to unfold, we begin to realize more and more that there are some uh, very pronounced secrets here. Uh, the first one, and perhaps the most um, the most important one uh, is when Dewey Dell, early in the book, starts to explain to us what's going on with her. And she's talking in a way that is, once again, coded. And as Kermode says, um, this interpretation of reality that the author is making is generating secrets because we may be able to decode uh, Faulkner's rendering, but we may not. And of course, particularly with this book, it's not a priority of Faulkner's to enable us to decode it. In fact, sometimes he seems to take perhaps uh, what we might call a perverse joy in uh, denying us that opportunity. So this is on page 27. As I said, Dewey Dell is uh, talking about picking cotton and she's in the field and she's with a gentleman who we don't really see at any other point in the novel. Uh, I mean, we see him tangentially because she talks about him on occasion, but his name is Leif. Um, and so they're walking down the, um, they're walking down the, uh, <clears throat> down the aisles uh, of the of the field. The first time me and Lake Leif picked on down the row. Pa doesn't sweat because he will catch his death from the sickness, so everybody that comes to help us. And Jewel don't care about anything, as he's as he is not kin to us in caring, not care kin. And Cash likes sawing the long, hot, sad, yellow days up into planks and nailing them to something. And Pa thinks because neighbors will always treat one another that way because he has always been too busy letting neighbors to do for him to find out. And I didn't think that Darl would, that sits at the supper table with his eyes gone further than the food and the lamp, full of the land dug out of his skull and the holes filled with distance beyond the land. So what we get there is initially her impression. <clears throat> she's talking about she's talking about Leif and her picking cotton. Um, and then she goes off on a digression about her father 
and about her brothers and her portrayal of them. And we don't quite know uh, what's going on here, why this matters. Um, and she continues speaking about them picking, and it seems that Leif is picking the cotton into her uh, sack. And basically what, what it turns out is um, that if the sack is full, when they get to the end of the row, she's made kind of a decision in her mind that if her sack is full, uh, when they get to the end of the row, she will do something. And if it's not, then she won't. Um, and at this point, it's still not clear what she's talking about. And this is page 27. And so it was because I could not help it. It was then. And then I saw Darl, and he knew. He said he knew without the words, like he told me that Ma is going to die without words. And I knew he knew, because he had said he knew with the words. Because if he had said he knew with the words, I would not have believed that he had been there and saw us. But he said he did know. And I said, are you going to tell Pa? Are you going to kill him? Without the words, I said it. And he said, why? Without the words. And that's why I can talk to him with knowing, with hating, because he knows. Um, so this becomes, again, a cryptic uh, communication. First off, the way she's using language is not exactly fall into that category of the social dialect that we've talked about previously. Um, when Cora was speaking, we have this, uh, you know, relatively direct language that's conveying something. Here, uh, we have this kind of cryptic circular reasoning and, and a rather, uh, you know, indirect uh, statement. But we know something. We know something about her relationship to Darl, and we know uh, something about, uh, about her feelings for him, right? And in fact, hatred becomes uh, one of the, you know, the early modes within the novel once again, bringing us back to the story of Agamemnon, right? Where again, when we talked about that narrative, uh, Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia to get propitious winds to leave for the Trojan War. Uh, Clytemnestra takes a lover while he's gone. Uh, they conspire to kill him when he returns, coming back with Cassandra, um, the, the slave that he brought with him. Uh, and so, and then her children uh, conspire to kill her, Clytemnestra's children, um, uh, Orestes and Electra uh, are, and are pursuing her, their mother, for having killed their father. And so you have this uh, family drama, right? Another one of the quotes um, that I had posted previously on our list of quotations for studying Faulkner uh, had to do with uh, the famous Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy from the first line of his great novel, Anna Karenina, begins... Um, all happy families resemble one another, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And that can certainly apply to the house of Atreus in Agamemnon and to the Bundren family in As I Lay Dying, uh, that they are certainly um, unhappy and each of them um, has their unique reasons for being unhappy. But that passage that Dewey Gell just read us, um, we see that uh, you know we're dealing with another level of language, that we're no longer in the social dialect. And in fact, what she's saying is even going beyond uh, their ability to communicate, that we, when we think of dialect and the unif unifying factor of it, the idea that we speak to one another and we can interpret and understand one another, um, here we're getting at the whole issue of words. And her communication with Darl is nonverbal. Um, and we see that a, a fair bit within this novel. Uh, probably the most pointed place we see it is in Addie's monologue, when Addie speaks about words and her distrust of words. Uh, I talked about that in the previous lecture, but basically that Addie doesn't feel that words uh, can quite get at what they're saying at, she says. Um, saying at is kind of a curious phrasing because uh, when you're, it implies trying to approximate meaning rather than having meaning when you speak. It's a bit like when you write your term paper, if you use words, uh, you know, malapropisms, words that are not exactly, uh, don't have exactly the meaning that you think they have, and they sort of change, subtly alter uh, the, the sense, the, the transmission of information that language is designed to do. Um, and Addie certainly feels that way in her monologue, and Dewey Dell uh, is also calling into question the, the sense that uh, words serve. <clears throat> and so, uh, now, here we've sort of conveyed her secret uh, 
like initially, but of course you can read that. And the only thing you know is that she knows that Darl knows. But what is it that she knows that Darl knows? Uh, as you go on, you can probably piece it together. But at this point, at this early point in the narrative, it's unlikely that you're absolutely aware unless you were reading, uh, you know, a summary of the book, in which case, you know, they tell you early on that Dewey Dell is pregnant. Uh, but if you kind of go through the process of ascertaining that on your own from the experience of reading the book, um, it doesn't become immediately obvious. And then obviously um, the bigger secret is the one that we unearthed last lecture, um, which is the one, the bombshell that comes out of Addie's chapter in the middle of the book, which is that uh, she had an affair with Reverend Whitfield and that Jewel is not her son by ants, but rather by Whitfield. And so uh, this rather long-term secret is uh, something that unfolds throughout the book. Once again, uh, it takes us a long time to get to it. The first place we see it is that first lines of the book that I mentioned to you uh, early on when we first started studying it. Um, but Jewel and I come up from the field following the path in single file. Although I am 15 feet ahead of him, anyone watching us from the cotton house can see Jewel's frayed and broken straw hat, a full head above mine, my own. Um, there's the obvious narrative quality of that where Darl seems to be disembodied. Uh, he doesn't seem to be inside his body. He's watching himself from outside. Um, you know, whether it's a sort of a multiple personality disorder type situation, but his insanity at the end of the book may be, um, you know, whether it's schizophrenic or some other, uh, you know, uh, mental illness that might be dissociative in the sense that he is not who, he's not inside himself. He's somewhere else or someone else. Um, and obviously the other element of this particular quote is that he's making mention, calling our attention as the first thing that's mentioned in the entire book, calling our attention to the fact that Jewel is significantly taller than him. And when you read it um, as the first lines of the book, there's no earthly reason why you should imagine that that could be at all important. Uh, but it is, in fact, hinting at something that is important that is then uh, elucidated further on in the novel through some of the things that Faulkner says through the mouths of some of the other characters. I can return immediately to the passage I just read a few moments ago by Dewey Dell, um, narrated by Dewey Dell, uh, to also illustrate this same point. And the first time I read that, I was using that to illustrate the point of her deep-seated um, secret of her pregnancy. But we have hints now at the other secret in that same passage. Uh, the first time me and Leif picked on down the row, Pa doesn't sweat because he will catch his death from the sickness, so everybody that comes to help us. And Jewel don't care about anything. He is not kin to us in caring, not care kin. Okay. Um, again, a subtle reference. Jewel, he doesn't care. We know that Jewel is angry, um, and so the fact that he doesn't care for us, he's not caring kin, could suggest that he's, uh, you know, maladjusted, and we know he has anger management issues, and Jewel is, uh, you know, a, a, a rather, a, you know, he's a person that is quite volatile, but clearly uh, using the word kin there implies precisely a blood relationship. Kin and kinship ties um, suggest that connection that is a family tie. Now, saying that he's not kin to us is, again, subtle uh, in that particular moment, but it's, uh, again, portraying the complex reality of the novel in a very subtle, coded way so that we are not uh, completely privy to, uh, to interpret it, to understand it. And part of the process of the book is exactly us trying to uh, make sense of it and trying to piece together what Faulkner is hinting at. And there's a whole lot of hinting and a whole lot of inferring. Uh, it makes the process of reading the book very, very different. As I said, Pride and Prejudice, uh, you might not like Pride and Prejudice for a number of reasons, uh, but it's a much more direct and straightforward narrative form. And then the information is conveyed to us in a very, very direct fashion. Here, it's not. And the last example that I'd like to use uh, is uh, a chapter narrated by Vardaman. Uh, this is on page 56 and 57 
in the book and it is conveying uh, a situation where we have just found out that Addie has died and so uh, Vardaman is the character most traumatized by this and so his reaction to this awareness when he finds out that his mother is dead is that he believes that Peabody is the one who killed him. Peabody is the doctor. The doctor has just shown up to try to help Addie uh, and Vardaman associates his arrival and his mother's death with a sort of a cause and effect. And so he believes that it's Peabody's fault. And so he goes to the barn with a stick and he frightens away uh, Peabody's horses. Peabody has come in a wagon and he hits them and causes them to run away. And the wagon ends up uh, overturned in a ditch and the horses uh, take a long, takes a while, but eventually they're brought back. Um, and nobody knows what happened, but everybody suspects what happened. And so here's Vardaman um, down in the barn uh, right around that time. <clears throat> it is dark. I can hear wood, silence. I know them, but not living sounds, not even him. It is as though the dark were resolving him out of his integrity into an unrelated scattering of components, snuffings and stampings, smells of cooling flesh and ammoniac hair, an illusion of a coordinated whole of splotched hide and strong bones within which, detached and secret and familiar, an is different from my is. I see him dissolve, legs rolling, legs, excuse me, a rolling eye, a gaudy splotching like old cold flames, and float upon the dark in fading solution, all one yet neither, all either yet none. I can see hearing coil towards him, caressing, shaping his hard shape. Okay, um, now this is a strange passage because number one, uh, Vardaman has uh, a very, very pronounced eloquence here. It's poetic. The words are complex. We know that Vardaman is a small child. Uh, we know he's been traumatized by his mother's death, um, but he's speaking like a dictionary uh, or something, ammoniac and uh, snuffings and stampings. And there's all sorts of words in there that kind of the, the whole diction of the passage suggests a complexity. But what's even stranger about it is what is he talking about? And once again, um, if you read this at the surface level, you can be slightly confused um, because he's using um, because he's because Faulkner is using pronouns here. It's not clear exactly what he's talking about. Uh, the pronoun, the obvious referent for the male pronoun in here, uh, is the horse, and probably <clears throat> because of the way he talks about it and the context that we, he talks about it and the splotched hide, um, we know that. It's actually Jules horse, the horse that he worked at night in order to earn the money for. And so his uh, efforts to earn the money and buy the horse are um, a result in him getting this horse. <clears throat> and we know that the relationship with Jules and his horse is a very, very strong one uh, because Jules' identity is kind of wrapped up with the horse. And when Ants forces him to sell the horse, it's almost like forcing him to part with uh, part of himself. And so um, on the one hand, there's that. However, there's also another level here, which is that um, Jewel and the horse have this sort of division and the he's there start to seem like could almost be referring to Jewel rather than the horse. If you look at the passage, um, the, the sort of the, the division, the division, the dividing line between Jewel and his horse is very, very uh, thin. Now, once again, that doesn't, seem like it is terribly significant and we may not pay a lot of attention to that. But later on, um, we finally realize uh, the, the realization of all of this and some of the symbolic importance of Jules' horse um, is that it associates him to something else because Jules' identity is wrapped up with the horse, um, but his identity is also wrapped up with the nature of his conception and the fact that Addie had an affair and we find out that she's very, very preferential of Jewel. Um, she feels uh, a certain obligation to him in a different way than she feels to her other children. And of course, that Whitfield is the other character who is strongly associated with a horse. Um, and so when we put all of this together, uh, you have this very, very subtle coding of what the 
the other secret is, right? When, when Kermode is talking about this idea of the genesis of the secret, the idea here is that there is um, a deep-seated, deep-seated within the narrative secret that needs to be uh, deciphered. And eventually we're given the tools to do it, but we are sort of restrained in that endeavor. And so it takes us until the middle of the book in that metaphorical heart when we find from Addie's chapter and then uh, reiteration from that in Whitfield's chapter that uh, this is in fact the big secret that they've been holding for that whole time. <clears throat> and so uh, in the end, uh, all of those passages have actually a, a deeper relevance that we most likely don't see. Um, now again, when you read this book, you might be totally flummoxed and just angry uh, about being forced to read passages like that. But I think if you go back and look at them, uh, you can start to piece together something uh, a little bit deeper that, that Faulkner is trying to do. Um, in our upcoming lecture, uh, we will focus on some of the animal symbolism in the book. And so certainly Jules' horse and, uh, you know, and Whitfield's horse as well uh, will get uh, a fair bit of treatment there, as well as many, many other animals. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the buzzards that are everywhere. We have the mules. Um, ants is frequently associated with a cow. So you have this whole uh, very pointed aspect of animal symbolism. Animal symbolism is very, very, uh, runs very deep through the classical canon. And certainly we'll maybe we'll be making those connections as well to the beginnings of the oral tradition and epic and how those relate there. So that is all for today's uh, lecture. You should now uh, head to click on the URL below the URL for this recording and it will take you to some questions that you should answer before the end of the class period. So have a very nice day and I will speak to you again on Wednesday.